It is now time for a question period. The Leader of Her Majesty's Royal Opposition. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the uh, Premier. Premier, your finance minister says he wants to, quote, optimize and maximize public assets. But, Premier, we both know what he really means is creating Warren Buffett style efficiencies. That means streamlining, it means cost cutting, it means job losses. It means jobs are about to disappear at the Liquor Control Board of Ontario, Ontario Power Authority, and Ontario Power Generation. Even Smokey Thomas, president of OPSU, recognizes that you can't eliminate the deficit in three years without cutting services for the people of Ontario when he said, quote, with what they're promising to spend and how they're promising to control costs, the public service can only shrink. And so my question, Premier, is quite simple. How many liquor store employees, LCBO employees, Hydro One employees, and OPG employees are about to lose their jobs? Thank you. Thank you very Great much, Mr. Question. Speaker. Well, <laughs> again, it is. I mean, it's an interesting situation when the uh, party that ran on immediately cutting 100,000 <laughs> jobs in Ontario, Mr. Speaker, um, are questioning us about uh, about that issue. So, Mr. Speaker, let me just say that the uh, the reason we have asked Ed Clark and his team to look at the assets that are owned by the people of Ontario is that we want to make sure that Order. they work to the optimal value, optimal benefit uh, for the people of Ontario. And I have, uh, I have said a number of times, Mr. Speaker, that had we had such a process in place, had the government of the day had such a process in place when they were looking at the 407, Mr. Speaker, oh, yes. I believe that there would not have been such a bad deal for the people bad of Ontario yeah, yeah, because so there's billions and billions of dollars yes, of revenue that are lost to the people of Ontario on what, what was a public asset, Mr. Speaker, Thank because you. of the arrangement, and we're not going to do that, Mr. Speaker. Supplementary. Again, to the Premier. Premier, here's a chance to display some of that transparency and accountability you always talk about. Here's a chance to tell the lenders and credit rating agencies exactly what you mean by optimize and maximize. Here's a chance to tell employees at the LCBO, OPG and OPA just how many of their jobs are on the line. So, Premier, why don't you just be honest? Can you tell the people of Ontario how many in jobs you intend to maximize out the door? Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, we have been very honest, and we are honestly concerned that the uh, assets that are owned by the people of Ontario that they be optimized, Mr. Speaker, and that uh, and that those revenues and that uh, that those assets work for the people of Ontario, so that we can reinvest in the infrastructure that is uh, needed, Mr. Speaker. So, for example, uh, selling the uh, LCBO headquarters, selling that real estate, selling the GM shares, Mr. Mr. Speaker, to make sure that we have that money to put into a, a fund in order to build public transit. That's responsible management of the assets of this province, Mr. Speaker. And to reinvest those dollars in infrastructure that is needed in 2014 is exactly what uh, is at the Answer. core of our investment strategy around uh, infrastructure, Mr. Speaker. I'll try again, uh, Mr. Speaker. Premier, you and your finance minister can speak in code. All you want, you can talk about optimizing and maximizing, but we all know that you mean job losses. You're simply not being honest with the people of Ontario. If you're going to meet these deficit reduction targets you always talk about, there comes a point where the rubber meets the road, so I'll ask you again in this chamber, in front of your peers, and for the benefit of viewers at home, how many people will be out of work by the time you finish selling off Ontario's assets? Thank you. Premier. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, you know, the reality is that the people of Ontario rejected the uh, proposal that was put forward by the member opposite and his team to cut and slash across government, Mr. Speaker, to cut public services. And what, what, the, uh, what the member opposite didn't talk about was the services that would have been cut as a result of Oxford. the uh, extreme and reckless plan that they were putting forward. That plan was rejected, Mr. Speaker. Our plan is to invest in the people of this province, to invest in their talent and their skills, Mr. Speaker. I was just at a forum this morning uh, with a visiting delegation from uh, China, Mr. Speaker, and I was talking to a, a business owner who is setting up a research and development um, uh, research and development ca capacity here in Ontario, and the reason Answer. for that is the talent and the skills of our people. He yep. said that explicitly. Because of our educated workforce, they are locating Thank here you. in Ontario. That's the kind of investment we. Need. Thank you. New question: The member from Kitchener, 
My question is to the Premier. Premier, yesterday you told the CBC that you'd be, quote, adding more GO trains immediately to the Kitchener-Waterloo line. That statement is a big departure from your GO announcement earlier this year when you said it would take until 2016 for you to deliver the trains you actually cut four years ago as Transportation Minister. Gone trains. Premier, simple question. Did you misspeak yesterday, or have you learned from the error of your ways and now realize your decision to slash GO train expansion to KW should be corrected as soon as possible? Here, here. To Mr. Transportation. To transportation. Well, thanks very, um, uh, very much, Mr. Speaker, and I, I thank the member from Kitchener for his question. Uh, this is the second opportunity that I've had since becoming the Minister of Transportation uh, to stand in my place here in the House and respond to a question from that member regarding the crucial investments that we are making in his community and communities right across Ontario. And I'll repeat today, Speaker, uh, what I said on the occasion of responding to that first question, which is this is one of the reasons that it's extremely important for members of that caucus and that particular member to support the budget that we've reintroduced in this legislature, Speaker. We are proposing, we are planning, and we are committed to investing $29 billion in crucial public transit infrastructure, which will serve communities like Kitchener-Waterloo. Uh, and I know that that member will want to work with us, in particular our members from his region, like the member from Kitchener Centre, to make sure that we implement a plan that makes sense for everyone in his community and right across Ontario. Thank you. Speaker, I, I know the new minister is keen, but these were the comments that were actually made Yesterday. by the Premier. Yesterday. So, Premier, I'll ask you again. Premier, I know you've got a majority, but you can ignore me, but not the constituents that I represent. Here, here. Here, 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 here. Premier, you doubled down yesterday on your commitment to build high-speed rail from London to Toronto, claiming you could deliver within a decade. Yet you continue to say you need until 2016 to add two GO trains to the Kitchener line that you actually cut as Transportation Minister. Premier, do you really expect Ontarians to believe that you can deliver high-speed rail in a decade when you say you need six years to add just two more GO trains to the Kitchener line? I don't get it. Thank you. Minister. Well, uh, thanks very much again, Speaker, and I, I'm not quite sure how much clearer we can make this uh, on this side of the House from, from the member opposite, uh, both, uh, both with respect to the question around high-speed rail service uh, and regarding the question of increasing GO service to his community. Uh, I just want to reiterate, try to make this as clear as I possibly can. Our government is committed to bringing full-day two-way GO train service uh, between the, the Waterloo region and the GTA. As we've said, this is a plan that's going to take place over the next number of years. The $29 billion that are included in our budget for these kinds of investments will help make sure that we can make this commitment uh, become reality, and we are determined to make, uh, make that uh, the case, Speaker. I should mention uh, that, as we've said in the past, by the end of 2016, Metrolinx will be adding four additional trains, two in the morning uh, and two in the afternoon, to serve the Kitchener Station. Wow. It's also important to note Speaker, that since 2003, Ontario has invested $19.3 billion in public Ooh. transit, specifically including $9.1 billion for GO service. Thank I again you. call on that member to support our Thank budget you. to help his community. So, so again, you just heard the minister say 2016, but the premier said yesterday she'd add those immediately. So clearly, uh, my constituents and across southwestern Ontario actually deserve an answer on this. So again, premier, yesterday you told the CBC Kitchener Waterloo that your transportation minister would release a third-party report that you say backs up your claims about high-speed rail from London to Toronto. But just last week, when I actually asked the minister in question period if he'd release the report. He refused. Ontarians are finding it hard to believe that you have any evidence to support your high-speed rail project, especially when experts across the province have rejected the proposal, calling it a fantasy. So, Premier, if you really don't have anything to hide, why don't you just order your transportation minister to release that report today? Yeah, good question. Thank you, <coughs> Minister. Thanks very much, Mr. Speaker. I thank the member opposite for that for that question again. You know, Speaker, in the interest of trying to, to provide clarity to that particular member, I am happy to provide to work with him to provide him uh, with a bit of a briefing on this issue outside of the uh, outside of this legislature. What I would say, though, Speaker, is it, it is important. It is important to recognize 
As I said in the answer to the second question, we have made significant investments in crucial public transit infrastructure over the last uh, 11 years, Speaker. And in fact, between 1999 and 2003, uh, the PCs contributed nothing to GO Transit, Speaker, leaving it to municipalities to carry the weight and the responsibility. I think what was abundantly clear. Speaker, I think what was abundantly clear in the course of this last election campaign is that the people of the Kitchener-Waterloo region, along with people right across this province of Ontario, understood the importance of the comprehensive and thoughtful plan that we are, we are going Answer. to implement, $29 billion over the next 10 years, $14 billion for communities outside the GTHA, wow. $15 billion you. for communities inside the GTA. Thank you. Get on board. New question, the leader of the third party. Thank you, Speaker. My uh, question is for the Premier. Does the Premier think it was a mistake for the Harris Conservatives to sell off the 407? Thank you. Say yes, <laughs> yes, I do, Mr. Speaker. I think the way it was done, I think the fact that there has been no long-term no long benefit to the people of Ontario uh, by that uh, decision that the previous government made was a mistake, and I have used the 407, Mr. Speaker, and the lack of good process around that as an example uh, of exactly why there needs to be a different process. That's exactly why we have asked Ed Clark and his team to look at the assets owned by the people of Ontario, to optimize them, to make sure that there is ongoing benefit for the people of Ontario and the ability to reinvest in new infrastructure, Mr. Speaker, which is needed answer. now in 2014. Thank you. Supplementary. Uh, Speaker, I didn't get a clear answer to my question. Does the Premier think selling off valuable assets like the 407? Stop the clock. Please finish. Does the Premier think selling off valuable assets like the 407, like the OPG, like the LCBO is a good idea? Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, I think I know where the um, member's going on this, Mr. Speaker. I think that the leader of the third party is trying to suggest that that's the agenda that we're sneaking into, uh, into uh, the legislature and into government. Mr. Speaker, it, is, it was a mistake to deal with the 407 in the way that the Conservatives did. That is my opinion, Mr. Speaker. I believe that there could have been a much better long-term benefit to the people of Ontario. It is also a mistake, Mr. Speaker, for a government never to review Absolutely. the assets, never to look at whether they are, they are producing the, the maximum benefit for the people of Ontario. So, Mr. Speaker, we're not going to make that mistake. We're not going to make either of those mistakes. We're going to have a process that is responsible, that is prudent, that looks at Answer. those assets and makes sure that they are performing for the people of Ontario. Final supplementary. Well, Speaker, nobody thinks the Liberals are sneaking anything anywhere. Her plan is based on $3.15 billion coming in the door from the sales of assets. It is clear as a bell in their budget. And we know that in the long term, these kinds of activities, these kinds of sell-offs, are a bad thing for the people of Ontario. It sets our province back. It cuts out sources of revenues. It leads to higher costs for the people of this province, Speaker. So why does the Premier think that asset sales are okay as long as they do it the Liberal way? So, Mr. Speaker, what I think is not just okay but responsible is that government look at the assets that are owned by the people of Ontario and that we make sure that in 2014 those assets are working in the best way possible so that the infrastructure that is needed, the investments that are needed now can be made. Right. So part of our plan, it's not our whole plan, but part of our plan is to look at those assets, yeah. to ask Ed Clark and his team, who have expertise, to look at those assets and make sure that they are working to the best way. advantage of the people of Ontario. That's responsible. That's what we're doing, Mr. Speaker. That's Answer. not what the previous government did with the 407. Thank you. New question. The of the Thank you, Speaker. My next question is uh, for the Premier. Does the Premier think that Ontarians voted for austerity and cuts? Premier. 
<laughs> Mr. Speaker, well, what we know, what we know, the people of Ontario did not vote for, Mr. Speaker, was a disparate, disconnected list of ideas that were basically based on our fiscal plan, Mr. Speaker, and didn't hang together and had no coherence. So they didn't vote for that, Mr. Speaker. They did not vote for the leader of the third. Finish, please. What we, the plan that we put forward, Mr. Speaker, was a plan that would build the province up. It's a plan that was rooted in the budget that we introduced at the beginning of May that would invest in the people of this province and their talent and their skills, which is drawing investment from around the world, Mr. Speaker, that would invest in the infrastructure that's needed, whether it's the roads and bridges in northern and rural Ontario or the transit in yes, our sir. urban centres, Mr. Speaker, and would set up an Ontario retirement pension plan so that uh, people would have have retirement security. That's what the plan is that we put forward. That's the plan we are eager to implement, Mr. Speaker. Speaker, does the uh, Premier think that Ontarians voted for the cost of everyday life to go up for them and their families? So, Mr. Speaker, what we know is that if we do not have an economy that is thriving, then it will be it, it very, very difficult for people to find jobs, Mr. Speaker. It will be difficult for our children and our grandchildren to have retirement security, Mr. Speaker. It will be extremely difficult to draw businesses to the province. So what we need to do is make sure that we make the right investments now, that we have the uh, constraints in place so that we can eliminate the deficit by 2017-18, Mr. Speaker, but making the investments in the province and making sure that we don't leave the most vulnerable behind. All of that is part of our plan, Mr. Speaker. That's the plan we ran on. That's the plan that we are eager to invest, and that's the plan that the people of Ontario voted for. Thank you. Final Speaker, the Liberals insist that their budget is progressive, but this is what people see. They see that yesterday the finance minister gave auto insurance companies another boost, while drivers continue to not see any savings. They see the Liberal plan will send hydro rates up by 42 per cent, another skyrocketing increase over the next number of years. There is growing acknowledgement, a chorus of growing acknowledgement, Speaker, that the job cuts that are hidden in this trophy Trojan horse budget will be significant. And they see a Premier who can't explain why she's moving forward with asset sales when she used to oppose them, Speaker. People have some pretty simple questions about this Trojan horse budget, and my question to the Premier is, why will she not come clean with the people of Ontario? Question. Thank you. Premier. Well, Mr. Speaker, <laughs> there was a lot in that question. I'm just going to uh, I'm going to focus on the auto insurance. Uh, the NDP through heard this throughout the candidate, uh, the leader of the third party's candidate for Halton tweeted, yeah. "Quote: Just got my latest car insurance payment update, and I'm paying $22 less a month. That's $260 less a year. There's been, on average, more than 5% reduction, Mr. Speaker, in auto insurance." And that the, uh, the leader of the third party knows that what people see in our budget, Mr. Speaker, many of them uh, across Order. the floor, they see $2.5 billion dollars in a jobs order. and prosperity fund, Mr. Speaker. They see $130 billion in public infrastructure investments, $11.4 billion in hospital expansions, a Made in Ontario retirement pension yes, plan. Sir. An increase in the Ontario Child Benefit, an increase in social assistance benefits, and $810 million for people with developmental Thank disabilities. All that. That's all part Thank of you. our plan. Thank you. New question. The member from Leeds, Thank you very much, uh, Speaker. Good morning. Uh, my question through you is to the Minister of Community Safety and Correctional Services. Minister, it's been uh, seven years since Ashley Smith suffered her terrible death, and seven months since a coroner's jury made recommendations uh, so that uh, this type of tragedy wouldn't re be repeated. On May 1st, the uh, federal government partnered with the Ottawa, Royal Ottawa Health Care Group to fund a two-bed pilot project for mentally ill female offenders at the Brockville Secure Treatment Unit in my riding. The partnership between the federal government and the hospital is because of this uh, treatment model's outstanding results with mentally ill male offenders. Minister, you know there are far too many women like Ashley in our Ontario jails suffering. 
My question is, do you think you should deny them access to a program male offenders have been able to access to, since 2003 because of their gender? Thank you. Thank, thank, thank you very much, uh, Speaker, and I thank the member opposite for, for asking a very important uh, question. I know it, it's an issue that uh, the member has uh, spoken about in the past and has ad advocated, uh, and I know my predecessor, uh, the Attorney General, has worked uh, with the member opposite on this issue as well. And, and, uh, and Speaker, so do I. I, I continue uh, to look into this matter. I've had the opportunity to speak with the CEO of the Royal Ottawa Hospital, which happens to be located in my community of Ottawa Centre. Uh, and most recently, I had a, a brief conversation with member opposite, and I look forward to continue working with him on this very important issue so that we are pro pro providing appropriate mental health treatment for all in inmates uh, within our detention system. Thank you, Thank Speaker. You. Supplementary. Yes, you're right, Minister. I have uh, spoken to you and your predecessor about this. In May, a spokesperson told Global News your ministry, quote, would be willing to review any proposal put forward by the federal government. Well, your government has given me the same answer since 2010, and the federal government has stepped up, Minister. You're wrong. The Attorney General is wrong. Chair, please. It's time to drop the excuse that you can do nothing now that the feds are moving forward. The good news is you've got a great opportunity now to do the right thing. You know, Minister, the good work that the Royal Ottawa Healthcare Group does with mentally ill patients. You know the good work that they do. So I'm asking you, will you commit today to bring the province to the table and finally, finally move forward with a plan to treat mentally Question. ill women offenders? They shouldn't be in the jail. They should be getting treatment. Yeah. Minister, when will you come to the Thank table? Thank you. Minister. Thank you very much, Speaker. Again, I thank the member opposite for uh, for his his question, and I uh, I will restate that uh, this is a very important issue. We need to make sure, Speaker, that we are treating all our inmates with fairness, with respect, and they deserve the same access to support as those uh, in the community. And I will continue, as the Minister of Community Safety and Correctional Services, I will continue to work along with all members of this House to ensure that those type of services are present uh, are uh, presented uh, for inmates in our custody. Uh, Speaker, Ontario has now, uh, has now in 10 correctional facilities with mental health nurses on site providing specialized services uh, to inmates, and we are launching the Forensic Early Intervention Service at the Toronto South Detention Centre. It's the first strategy of its kind in Canada. There's a lot of work that is ongoing right now, Speaker, in our uh, correctional facilities yes, to ensure that inmates with mental health challenges are given proper treatment. I look forward to working with the member opposite to make sure that female in inmates have fair and equal treatment available to them as well. Thank you, Speaker. New, new question. The member from Bramley, Dora Thank you very much. My question is to the Minister of Finance. Mr. Speaker, four years ago, the Liberal government put $2 billion into the pockets of the insurance industry. No. They slashed our benefits and resulted in a cost savings to the insurance, to the insurance industry of $2 billion annually. Yet, Drivers in Ontario are still paying the highest auto insurance in the entire country. Terrible. While they move so quickly to slash the benefits for drivers, they move so quickly to increase the profits for the insurance industry. Why is it that the new plan announced yesterday by the Minister of Finance seeks again to put more money into the pockets of the insurance industry, but drivers are still waiting to see any reduction in their insurance rates? Interesting question from a member across the way who says he's advocating for lower rates, yep. and yet when we tried putting forward legislation last February, found ways to stall it, delay it, and force us to having to now reintroduce it after a forced election, which had it been done initially, would have resulted in lower rates today. We have been fighting for lowering insurance rates since 2003. We've taken measures in 2010 to provide for the anti-task force. We've been going forward in 2011. We've had private members from our side of the House that have been advocating for the same, and we will continue to do that 
obviously without their support because they voted against the very measures that would have reduced insurance rates by this point in time, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, the measures that the Minister of Finance is speaking about have no guarantee whatsoever of reducing insurance rates for drivers, but certainly will increase the profits for the insurance industry. Now, when asked yesterday point blank, will this minister and will this government be able to reach their 8% target reduction by August, the silence was deafening in the response by the Minister of Finance. Now, instead of guaranteeing, instead of guaranteeing that yes, there will be reductions, the Minister of Finance said, shop around. Shop around and maybe you can find them. Now, the budget is silent on any new measures to guarantee a reduction for drivers in Ontario. I have a very simple question for the Minister of Finance. It's very clear that the Minister of Finance is not going to reach the August 8 per cent reduction ahead. deadline. Will the Minister commit to guaranteeing a reduction for drivers instead of continually putting more Thank and more you. money in the pockets of the insurance industry? Thank you. Minister of Finance. Mr. Speaker, because of the measures that we've taken, because we've added more teeth to fiscal, because we're adding the dispute resolution systems acceleration, because we're looking after the towing industry, because we're working with, uh, with adjusters and appraisers to ensure that there's a proper uh, dispute mechanism and an appeals process to provide for uh, uh, charges against those that may violate, because we're attacking fraud, because we're looking after the clinics that are, are doing this, because we're reaching and doing everything we can to reduce the claim costs, which results in higher premiums, we have made measures to reduce premiums as well. We have well over 14 uh, insurance companies who have publicly filed with reduction in their rates by more than 10 percent, some as high as 14 and 15 percent already. We have publicized this. We have put them in the, on the web pages. If it, and his own colleagues Answer. have resulted, they themselves have said that they've already received lower rates because they've taken the measures and because they've made those calls. We will act, obviously, without the Thank you. Because they please. Your question. The member from York Southwestern. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Safe and affordable housing is an issue that affects all Ontarians, whether they live in my riding of York Southwestern, in Windsor, or in Thunder Bay. During the recent election, the need for our government to continue investing in affordable and social housing was an issue that was frequently brought to my attention. And last week, in the throne speech, our government committed to building a fairer, and healthier province, and that means greater access to affordable housing. The question I'm now being asked is how are we going to tackle this pressing need? So, Mr. Speaker, through you to the Minister, could he please explain what our government is doing and will do to ensure that we continue to invest in the vulnerable Ontarians who need greater access to safe and affordable question. housing? Thank you. Minister of Municipal Affairs and uh, Thanks, uh, Mr. Speaker. I want to thank the member from York Southwestern for her ongoing advocacy in this area. Uh, we understand that uh, long-term local solutions are really the only way to address uh, the ongoing uh, need to house uh, vulnerable folk. Absolutely. Uh, that's why our government is focusing on Ontario's uh, Housing First strategy. We've invested over $3 billion uh, in uh, affordable housing, more than any government before us. Uh, and in our throne speech, Mr. Speaker, our government committed to expanding the community homelessness prevention initiative and the investment in affordable housing programs. Great news. But it's not an issue just for the province or municipalities. To be brutally frank, we, we need an ongoing federal partner that we can we count sure on do. for a housing Answer. Supplementary. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for confirming our government's commitment to social and affordable housing. As you may know, the first cooperative housing building in the City of Toronto was built in my riding of York Southwestern, a residence called Beach Hall. However, Beach Hall is experiencing a crisis that it hasn't seen the like since the 1970s, when the Toronto Borough of York threatened to uh, phase out this complex in favour of a new development. The 
federal government till now has provided assistance to co-ops and other housing providers through programs started in the 70s and the 80s. However, these agreements are expiring and it's, the date is quickly approaching where most of these contracts will be phased out. Now, many residents of Beach Hall are calling on the federal government to maintain the existing housing stock, and they believe that the federal government needs to come back to the table with long-term stable sources of funding. Mr. Speaker, through you to the minister, could he please explain what our government will do to ensure that the federal government Thank you. maintains its funding? Minister. Mr. Speaker, our uh, government uh, certainly welcomed the March 2013 announcement by the federal government to renew the uh, joint housing program for the next five years. That said, they've also indicated that they're about to get out of maintaining existing social housing stock, which causes us some real concern. Sure. So it remains the fact that the federal government's contribution uh, is going to be reduced, reduced and reducing and reducing quickly over the next 15, 20 years. So if we're going to get on with the social housing and cooperative housing um, uh, opportunities that are presented and uh, which many stakeholders in, on in Ontario have been able to avail themselves of, we are going to have to work together. The federal government, the provincial government and the municipal government. And I hope the opposition uh, and the third party will join Answer. us. Uh, in our efforts, and particularly with respect to putting pressure on the federal government. Thank you. Here. New question, the member from Whitby, Oshawa. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Premier Elizabeth Nicholson is a 24-year-old young woman who is living with a very rare disease called spinal cerebellar ataxia. This is a painful and disabling neurodegenerative disease, which is ultimately terminal. Elizabeth's needs have recently become so significant that her family is not able to care for her anymore at home, given that she requires 24-7 assistance. Her family has finally found a place where she can live out her days in comfort and dignity. Although it's very difficult to find a place that can accommodate her needs, her family has found such a place in its Sunbeam Lodge in Kitchener. Yet, the Ministry of Community and Social Services refuses to fund the $40,500 it will cost to keep her there for six months, which is just a little over $200 a day, which will keep Elizabeth there for, for what might well be her last six months. Recently, her family was forced to resort to the Question. internet to essentially crowdfund the money that she needs. Shame. Premier, on behalf of Elizabeth and her family, will you commit to funding her stay at Sunbeam Lodge? Thank you. So Exactly community and social services. The Minister of Community and Social Services. Exactly. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member for Whitby Oshawa for this question. Of course, we cannot discuss any particular individual case uh, because of issues of uh, confidentiality. Uh, but as a government, I know uh, that we remain totally committed to supporting those with developmental disabilities, uh, and we are providing additional services. Uh, we do take this issue incredibly seriously. I know the member uh, op opposite, uh, uh, from having worked with her previously on the Select Committee on Mental Health and Addiction is totally committed to issues around the vulnerable. And I would just say to her that we also share that kind of commitment to what we are doing in the developmental uh, dis dis disability community. And we do believe very strongly that yes, the families, uh, the individuals need the type of support uh, that uh, perhaps we have heard about in this particular Thank case. You. And we are committed to that. Yeah, yeah. Well, I would say to the minister, this is a situation that really requires immediate attention. And the answer that the family got back through the, your ministry is that the Developmental Services Office is going to offer them some kind of respite or some kind of passport funding, which we all know there isn't any money for. This young person needs a place within the last six months. She has a. Stop the clock. Thank you. Thank you. Please. Finish. We have no idea what the money is going to be used.
things for that's been allocated in the budget. You have not been forthcoming on that, but this is a very specific case where this young woman needs your attention, and all we get is a process answer. Well, you can't hide behind process on this. We all know that there is a way to do this if there's a will to do this. So, Minister, will you please summon the will and find a way to fund this young woman's stay for her what might be her last six months at Sunbeam Lodge? Will you please do so? Please. Thank you. Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. So perhaps maybe we need an explanation of what exactly is in our budget for those with developmental disabilities. First of all, I think the member does know that Developmental Services Ontario offices work together with families to explore all possible solutions in the community. And so in our upcoming budget, we're proud to be proposing an investment of $810 million over the next three years to significantly strengthen developmental services for people in Ontario. This is the single largest infusion of support to the sector in this province in history. Wow. And this proposed Please finish. This proposed additional funding would increase our government's investment in developmental services to Answer. more than $2 billion in 2016-2017. This means there will be support for an additional 1,400 people with urgent residential needs. Thank it will you. eliminate wait lists for 8,000 children. New questions. Member from Oshawa. Okay, thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Associate Minister of Finance. Pooled retirement pension plans are Stephen Harper approved plans that are good for banks. They are, however, a gamble for families. The Liberals insist their plan is progressive, but it is a plan that's great for Bay Street, but leaves Main Street falling behind. Jim Leach is the head of the Ontario Teachers Pension Plan. He knows a thing or two about pensions. This is what Jim Leach had to say about the promise of these private pensions. If markets have been bad, your retirement lifestyle will be far less. So my question, why is the Premier gambling on a Stephen Harper-approved private pension scheme? Thank you, Speaker, and I want to thank uh, member opposite for her question and uh, congratulate her on her appointment as critic for pensions. We know that this is a very important issue in Ontario because our population is aging and we have to prepare for the future. And that is why, Speaker, we have proposed the Ontario Retirement Pension Plan, which is an opportunity for us to put away a little bit today for the retirement that is coming tomorrow. And our Ontario Retirement Pension Plan is going to be providing pensions for those in the middle class who currently are without a workplace pension. It will be a comparable and, uh, and, and, and in fact, will work very well with voluntary plans like the PRPP, like RRSPs, and other means, Speaker. But what is important is that we plan for now for what is inevitable in the future, which is an aging population, Speaker. And we know that we yes, are not adequately covering three million people without yeah, a workplace-based yeah. pension. I, uh, I am now moving to warnings, individual warnings. When I get quiet, somebody uses that opportunity to, to say something, I'll get you. Supplementary. Mm -hmm. Well, like the budget, this pension plan is a Trojan horse plan. Yep. The Premier's rhetoric is all about a new public pension plan, but when you look inside, you find Stephen Harper's private pensions. Stephen Harper likes this plan because it helps out banks, and the bank fees on this PRPPs can take a third out of your retirement savings. It's just another way that Bay Street benefits and Main Street falls behind. So again, why is the Premier's pension plan putting banks ahead of people? Speaker, the fact of the matter is, is that we actually took our plans to voters in Ontario, and they have overwhelmingly confirmed that. 
We have ensured that we're taking care of people's retirement futures. This is right. about building Ontario up, Speaker. Absolutely. And in fact, you talk about what uh, economists are saying. And in fact, when we plan for the future and give people a predictable stream of income in their retirement years, this is in fact good for our economy. It sustains our economies in cities and towns across this province. So, Speaker, we're doing the smart thing by introducing the Ontario Retirement Pension Plan while ensuring that voluntary options are still av available to people so that they can meet their retirement goals. Answer. And that is the responsible and the smart thing to do. In terms of Thank, you. Ontario's Thank, you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Transportation. Mr. Speaker, Ottawa is a world-class city. It is not only a great place to live, but also a destination for businesses and tourists. My constituents and those who visit the city are able to experience and appreciate so much of what the city has to offer. Being a world-class city means we also need a world-class transit system. That is why, with the support of the Ontario government, Ottawa is building the Ottawa LRT system. This 2.1 billion confederation line is our solution for our transit needs. Not only that, but my constituents are thrilled that it will help promote the economics, culture, and social benefits of the great city of Ottawa. Question. Mr. Speaker, through you to your minister, can you please speak to the investment we've made so far in the LRT? Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. And I want to begin by thanking the, the new member from Ottawa Orleans for that fantastic question. question. Speaker, our government has also recognized the impact that the Ottawa LRT will have on the city of Ottawa. Uh, it is indeed a world-class city, a city that's population is projected to grow by 30 percent up until 2031, and public transportation is already nearing its capacity in the downtown core. And these are some of the reasons, Speaker, why in 2009 our government committed up to $600 million towards stage one of the Ottawa LRT project. Speaker, thanks to the advocacy of all of the caucus members that we have on this side from Ottawa, that is the single largest investment ever made to the city's public transit system from the provincial government. The LRT is something that all of our Ottawa caucus members have advocated for. Through them, the government has recognized the impact this would have on residents, tourists, Answer. and business within that city. Construction began on the Confederation Line in April 2013, and the City of Ottawa projects that this project will create approximately 20,000 jobs. To correct my record, and I apologize for the member from Ottawa Orleans on a supplementary. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Response. The benefits of the project to our city are vast, both socially and economically. Ottawa's prosperity depends on moving people more efficiently. The LRT will mean reliable commuting, lower emissions, and quieter neighbourhoods, all while creating jobs. It is estimated that 67 per cent of residents of Ottawa will live within five kilometres of the LRT. I know we're excited to see the completed LRT going down the road in 2018. Mr. Speaker, what's even more encouraging to the people of Ottawa Orleans and the rest of the city of Ottawa is that our government's investment haven't stopped here. Can the minister speak to what other investment the government of Ontario has made to the transportation infrastructure of Ottawa and how have my residents Question. of Ottawa Orleans benefited from this government? Minister. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And again, I thank the member from Ottawa Orleans for that fantastic follow-up. Easing congestion and helping commuters get home quicker is one of our government's main objectives. And that's why, Speaker, we've committed approximately $1.09 billion to support public transit in Ottawa since 2003. This includes $27 million for transit maintenance and approximately $314 million in gas tax funding. Specifically, as part of the Ottawa LRT agreement, we have also committed to widening Highway 417 between Nicholas Street and the Ottawa Road 174 split. This, Mr. Speaker, will help ensure the Ottawa LRT is successful. As the member knows, as every member knows, our budget includes our Moving Ontario Forward plan. This is a plan that would see a record investment of $29 billion to support transportation infrastructure, $15 billion within the GTHA, and $14 billion for the rest of the province. Answer. Investments like these will help to boost our economy and break the congestion that is costing us billions of dollars a year. Thank you. Thank you. Question, the member from Stormont, Dundas, and South Bloomberg. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Economic Development. 
Since taking over government just 10 years ago, my riding of Stormont, Dundas, and South Glengarry has lost over 4,000 good-paying manufacturing jobs. In just the past few months, three more co companies have announced they are closing their doors. American Standard, Ken Light Phillips, and Sentient Biopharma, consolidating operations and moving almost 300 jobs to our U.S. neighbours. When will the minister realize that the need to tackle the out-of-control regulation, fees, taxation, and hydro rates that are making our province uncompetitive and unattractive to businesses that are not receiving your government's corporate give giveaways? Thank you, Minister of Economic Development, Employment, and Infrastructure. Well, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. No matter how hard the PCs try to spin it, no matter how hard they try to talk down Ontario's economy, the fact of the matter is that it is a fact that we're up 460,000 debt jobs since the recession. Mr. Speaker, if the member opposite really cared about jobs in this province, he'd be supporting the budget that we're, we want to get moved forward this summer before the House uh, adjourns. Mr. Speaker, if he was really concerned about jobs in the economy, he'd su be supporting our $2.5 billion Jobs and Prosperity Fund that's designed to continue to attract investment into this province. That's made us number one in North America for foreign direct investment. And, Mr. Speaker, that helps all sectors of our economy. If he really cared about jobs in this province, he'd be supporting our budget, Mr. Speaker, which invests $130 billion in infrastructure, creating and supporting up to 100,000 jobs, Mr. Thank Speaker, you. every single year. Thank you. Supplementary. Back to the minister. Ontario's unemployment rate has been above the national average for over 90 months. The government has managed to lose almost 50,000 private sector jobs last month alone. Our public services rely on a healthy private sector that generates wealth and prosperity, but this government seems bent on driving our private sector out of Ontario. Minister, will you tackle the competitive issues that are forcing our private sector companies to move to the neighbouring states and provinces, or will you stand idly by as our skilled workforce languishes in the unemployment line? Sir. Mr. Speaker, we've just brought forward a budget that totally focuses on creating jobs and building a stronger economy. In stark contrast to that, you just fought an election on a platform that does nothing but kill jobs across this province. And I'm not just talking, I'm not just talking about the 100,000 jobs you directly wanted to kill. I'm talking about the 500,000 jobs that you and your party would place at risk indirect, direct and indirect in our auto sector. I'm talking about the 50,000 jobs, Mr. Speaker, that we were creating through our regional economic development funds and our partnerships with Open Text, Mr. Speaker, and other companies like Cisco. 50,000 jobs under you that would be gone. I'm talking about the 30,000 clean energy jobs that you do not support and the clean energy economy that we would bring to an end. Mr. Speaker, if you add it all up, they talked about a million jobs they're going to bring, bring in. Mr. Speaker, they'd be Thank putting you. a million jobs at risk. Thank you. No question. The member from London, Fanshawe. Speaker, my question is to the Premier. A few days ago, Premier, you claimed that a high-speed rail link between London and Toronto was possible within a decade. And yet, high-speed rail is mentioned nowhere in your budget. No timelines, no funding, nothing at all. Mr. Speaker, if the Premier really intends to build high-speed rail to London, why isn't it mentioned anywhere in her budget? Minister of Transportation. Minister of Transportation. Thanks very much, Mr. Speaker, and I, um, I thank the member from London for that, for that question. Obviously, high-speed rail is very, very important to our government. It's very important to the people of London, Kitchener, Waterloo, communities like Windsor and beyond. Speaker, I think it's important for everyone to understand that with almost $14 billion in new revenue tools that are provided for in the budget to fund transportation projects outside of the GTHA, this, uh, the high-speed rail project is one of the ones that we plan to pursue to help create jobs and help boost the economy outside, uh, sorry, in the London area. Uh, as you may know, the government had undertaken a pre-feasibility study. The Ministry of Transportation had done that work, uh, and we are working hard uh, to work with all partners, municipalities, and everyone else in the system to develop an implementation plan that makes sense. But this is why, as we've said throughout this week, throughout the budget debate, Speaker, that it's very important for members, particularly from those communities that will benefit greatly from the investments Answer. we plan to make, to support our budget, work with us, and get on with the projects. Thanks very much. Supplementary. 
Okay. Speaker, there is no funding for high-speed rail in the budget. It's not even mentioned in your budget. In fact, the government has been silent on how it will pay for transportation priorities that are mentioned in the budget. The government has only found half the money needed to pay for existing transportation promises, not including the magical high-speed rail line. How will the government make up the difference? By selling public assets? By cutting programs? Mr. Speaker, Ontarians deserve the truth. Will the Premier finally admit she can't keep her promises and her government will deliver austerity, not a high-speed rail? Thank you, Minister. Thanks very, thanks very much, uh, Speaker, and I do thank the member opposite again for that follow-up question. Uh, I, I, I thought that I was fairly clear in my initial response regarding, uh, regarding how very clearly our budget lays out a plan to make transportation and public transit investments right across the province of Ontario, $29 billion. I've said that repeatedly since having the chance to serve in this particular capacity, Speaker. That includes up to 14, close to $14 billion for transit and transportation infrastructure projects in, in areas outside of the GTH, GTHA, would have, which would, of course, include the community of London. As I mentioned a second ago, the Ministry of Transportation has undertaken a, free a pre feasibility study. Uh, we are in the process of finalizing a business case and embarking on an environmental assessment. I would ask the member opposite to again consider supporting the budget yes, that we have introduced in this House. It includes the funding for $14 billion worth of projects which would benefit the people Thank of you. London. You should support this project. Thank you. Uh, when I stand, you sit. New question, the member from Durham. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Aboriginal Affairs. Mr. Speaker, this government has been investing in people, investing in infrastructure, and supporting an innovative and dynamic business environment. We all recognize that a strong and vibrant Aboriginal community strengthens Ontario culturally, socially, and economically. Minister, while we are making progress across many different areas, can you please elaborate on how we, we have been helping to improve and create create greater economic opportunities with the Aboriginal communities in Ontario. Thank you. Uh, speaker, we are active on many fronts, creating opportunities for the private sector and the First Nations and Métis communities to participate in a meaningful way in our plan to grow Ontario's economy. The 2014 budget, if passed, includes an Aboriginal Economic Development Fund, which includes an investment of $25 million over three years. Excellent. The fund will support Aboriginal communities in the development of long-term economic strategies. It will also provide grants for Aboriginal businesses and the fund province-wide regional skills training. Mr. Speaker, this government recognizes the importance of economic development for Aboriginal communities and wants to see meaningful employment and business development for all Aboriginal communities in Ontario. Very good. Two supplementary. Thank you, Minister. This is great news, Mr. Speaker. Obviously, this is a great investment, both in helping people, communities and businesses to create a more robust business environment. Mr. Speaker, the, Abor the, Ab the, Aboriginal, the Aboriginal Loan Guarantee Program was announced as part of the 2009 budget as a way to both enhance Aboriginal participation in Ontario infrastructure and to encourage forays into renewable green energy. Mr. Speaker, last week I joined the Minister in a meeting with Chief Marsden of Alderville First Nation near my riding of Durham, to hear an update on the Otherville Solar Project. Thanks to the Loan Guarantee Program, it, it is Question. the province's first ground solar farm holy First Nation community. Mr. Speaker, through you, to the Minister, what is the Ontario doing to ensure thank more you. communities can benefit from this program? Mr. Minister. Uh, thank you. Uh, speaker, the uh, 2014 budget, if passed, would con uh, continue the Aboriginal Loan Guarantee Program, which was launched in 2009 to facilitate Aboriginal participation in renewable energy infrastructure projects. 
To date, the program has leveraged significant investments with $130 million in approved loan guarantees, which have supported the investments of eight communities representing over 10,000 First Nations people in four projects that have invested, uh, uh, parlayed the investment into a total of $2.8 billion for the province. I did have the pleasure last week to meet with Chief Marsden of Alderville First Nation along with the member for Durham, and I'm happy to say that one of the four projects include the recently approved loan guarantee that will support a portion of the Alderville First Nation's equity investment in the Alderville Answer. Solar Project, making it the first 100 per cent Aboriginal-owned solar project in Ontario. The guarantee works to the benefit of all. Thank you. New question, the member from Simcoe North. Sir Grady College and University Speaker. Mr. Speaker, Bernie Fishbean worked as an advocate for the Electricians' Union, representing them in over 60 separate legal cases over the past 20 years. Despite this obvious conflict of interest, your College of Trade saw fit to appoint him as chair of the Electricians' Ratio Review Panel, where he went on to choose, rec choose recommend the ratio proposed by the union that employed him for 20 years. Minister, it, it is unbelievable that you have accepted this conflict of interest and done nothing about it. And Mr. Speaker, yesterday the minister told the House he was going to appoint an advisor to review the boondoggle at the College of Trades. Mr. Speaker, in spite of this, his clear conflict of interest and in spite of his ongoing judicial review and his bias, Bernie Fishbean is apparently to be considered for this job, a re whole review of the College of Trades. So to the minister, will you be appointing this longtime paid advocate of the Electricians' Union, Bernie Fishbean, to be your advisor Question. for the planned review of the Ontario College of Trades? Thank you. thank you, Mr. Speaker. I want to thank the member opposite for that question. Mr. Speaker, the College of Trade has been doing a great job since it started its operation just about over a year ago. We created this college because we believe that, Mr. Speaker, the trades people there, the people who can decide on their own profession. That's why we have created the College of Trade. Not only that, Mr. Speaker, to raise the profile of the trades people, because we believe that electricians, mechanics, and other uh, professionals and other uh, trades people, they have the same right and uh, they have the same right as doctors, dentists, and the teachers and others to, to regulate their own profession. That's why we have created the College of Trades, and they've been doing a great job, Mr. Speaker, since they started their operation about a year, a year ago. Mr. Speaker, in the past uh, uh, 14, 15 months since their operation, they have reviewed 33 professions, 32 yes, trades, and they've reduced the ratios in 14 of them, Mr. Speaker. So I'll address the question in the second part, Thank Mr. You. Speaker. Thank you. Well, you didn't address the first part of the question. So, <laughs> so first of all, let's correct the record. Under Fishbean's biased recommendation, Ontario raised apprenticeship ratios for the electrician's trade from 3 to 1 to 6 to 1, that is more than double. They got exactly what the union wanted. Second, the College of Trades is a boondoggle. It's not, you, you have to know that no one likes it after all this. So special, special interest groups are running the place, they're restricting competition, and are raising the cost of hiring tradespeople for Ontario companies. Also, in fact, young Ontarians are leaving to take apprenticeships in other provinces. So to the minister, have you had any discussions with special interest groups regarding the appointment of this advisor, Mr. Bernie Fishman, to the Ontario College of Trades? Minister, what deals have been made regarding Bernie Fishman's appointment? Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, uh, the College of Trade, as I said, has been doing a great job. And in relation to the uh, conflict of interest, uh, the member uh, uh, referring to it, the case is before the court, so I'm not going to comment on that, Mr. Speaker. But you know, Mr. Speaker, since we created the College of Trade for the past many, many years, when the members opposite uh, his party was in office, they never reviewed any single profession, uh, really? the ratios. They never did it. But the College of Trade. Within just uh, 40, 50 months since its operation, they re reviewed uh, the ratios in 33 professions, Mr. Speaker, 33 trades, and they reduced the ratios in, in 14 of them. So they have been doing a great job, Mr. Speaker, and this is for the first time in the history of this province that we have a regulatory college for trades people, and they actually love to have this college, Mr. Speaker. They want to have the college. They want to, uh, to, uh, to decide on their yes, own profession. That's why we have created the college, and trades people they like the college in contrast to what uh, the, the member opposite claims. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Your question, the member from Algoma, Manitoba. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Good morning to you. My question is to the Minister of Labour. Yesterday, the members of this legislature rose for a moment of silence for minor Pascal Goulet, 
38, leaving behind his spouse and two daughters, killed tragically last Thursday at his job at North American Palladium. Unfortunately, Mr. Goulet is the seventh minor killed on the job this year in Ontario. One death is too many, but seven is an outrage. Minors and their families have a right to expect that they'll come home safe at the end of their shift. What will this minister do today to ensure that not one more minor is killed in this province and that their workplaces are safe? Question. Thank you. Thank you, Speaker. I do thank the, uh, the Honourable Member for that very, very important question. I was saddened to hear of the incident, as all of us were around the House, and uh, my thoughts are with this person's family and the colleagues that he was working with. I understand that we have uh, the Ministry of Labour inspectors on the site investigating. The Ministry's priority in this regard is to ensure that the Occupational Health and Safety Act is followed and enforced. The, the um, investigation is ongoing, Speaker. As you know, it would be inappropriate for me to, uh, to comment on any specific circumstances related to this incident. I will, I will tell you, though, that this government is committed to protecting the health and safety of minors and all workers in Ontario. We're leading right now. Our chief prevention officer uh, is leading a comprehensive mining safety review. It's got an external group of industry, labour yes, and health and safety reps and it's a year-long review. I look forward to those findings. And, Speaker, to answer the question specifically, I look forward to acting upon those findings. Thank you. Supplementary, the member for message. Thank you, Speaker, again to the Minister of Labour. Last year, the Premier rejected an inquiry into mining deaths and instead chose to review uh, health and safety. But at the very first public hearings, the government didn't even advertise to invite participants. So while we eagerly await the review's findings, minors in this province continue to die. Based on the Westray law and supported by the United Steel Workers, who represent minors across this country, Nova Scotia recently decided to create a special prosecutor to enforce workplace safety standards. Will the minister act today on the appalling seven mining industry deaths this year and create a special prosecutor to enforce workplace safety standards in the province of Ontario. Thank you, Speaker. As, he, as uh, the previous questioner noted, one death is too many. Seven is not good, one is not good, Speaker. Between March and June of this year, We've had 12 public consultation dates. We've been to Timmins, we've been to Kirkland Lake, we've been to Sudbury, Red Lake, Marathon, London, to ensure that the mining sector itself, and that's from labour and business, please. safety representatives, are able to provide input into the mining review. This is a review that we intend on acting upon, obviously, Speaker, once we've heard from everybody. Over 150 people to date have participated in these public meetings. We've got over 60 written submissions. We're working very, very hard with the Chief Prevention Officer. As I said, Speaker, I look forward to the findings. When those findings are in, we intend to act upon those findings. Minister of Finance on a point of order. Speaker, we have uh, young people who participate in politics. It's always nice to uh, acknowledge interns who show up and want to do this. And I'd like to acknowledge Hashish Abororo and Sean Chukma who are here today as interns participating in the political process. We have a deferred vote. Uh, on the motion that this House approves in general the budgetary policy of the government, calling the members, this will be a five minute bill.
Everyone take their seats, please. Take your seats, please. On July 14th, Mr. Susan moved, seconded by Ms. Wynn, that this House approves in general the budgetary policy of the government. All those in favour of the motion, please rise one at a time and be recognized by the clerk. Mr. Souza. Mr. Souza. Mr. Souza. Mr. Nancy. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Shirelli. Mr. Shirelli. Mr. Shirelli. Madame Mayor. Madame Mayor. Ms. Wynn. Ms. Wynn. Ms. Matthews. Ms. Matthews. Mr. Hoskins. Mr. Hoskins. Ms. Sandals. Ms. Sandals. Mr. Duga. Mr. Duga. Ms. McCharles. Ms. McCharles. Mr. Quinter. Mr. Quinter. Mr. Cole. Mr. Cole. Mr. Takar. Mr. Takar. Mr. Bardinetti. Mr. Bardinetti. Mr. Dillon. Mr. Dillon. Mr. Quadri. Mr. Quadri. Mr. Rosetti. Mr. Rosetti. Mr. Gravel. Mr. Gravel. Mr. McNeekin. Mr. McNeekin. Mr. Murray. Mr. Murray. Mr. Chan. Mr. Chan. Mr. Moridi. Mr. Moridi. Mr. Coteau. Mr. Coteau. Mr. Leo. Mr. Leo. Mr. Flynn. Mr. Flynn. Mr. Zimmer. Mr. Zimmer. Mr. Delaney. Mr. Delaney. Mr. Balkison. Mr. Balkison. Mrs. Albanese. Mrs. Albanese. Mr. Dixon. Mr. Dixon. Ms. Vanga. Ms. Vanga. Mr. Pratt. Mr. Pratt. Ms. Wong. Ms. Wong. Ms. Hunter. Ms. Hunter. Mr. Sergio. Mr. Sergio. Mr. Morrow. Mr. Morrow. Ms. Jassic. Ms. Jassic. Mr. Del Duca. Mr. Del Duca. Ms. Domerla. Ms. Domerla. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Anderson. Mr. Anderson. Mr. Baker. Mr. Baker. Mr. Ballard. Mr. Ballard. Mr. Dong. Mr. Dong. Ms. Hogarth. Ms. Hogarth. Ms. Koala. Ms. Koala. Madame Lalonde. Madame Lalonde. Ms. Molly. Ms. Molly. Mrs. Martin. Mrs. Martin. Mrs. McGarry. Mrs. McGarry. Mrs. McMahon. Mrs. McMahon. Mr. Milchin. Mr. Milchin. Ms. Nadu Harris. Ms. Nadu Harris. Mr. Potts. Mr. Potts. Mr. Rinaldi. Mr. Rinaldi. Ms. Verniel. Ms. Verniel. All those opposed, please run it. Rise one of the time to be recognized by the clerk. Mr. Fidelli. Mr. Fidelli. Mr. Clark. Mr. Clark. Mr. Arna. Mr. Arna. Mr. Hardiman. Mr. Hardiman. Ms. McLeod. Ms. McLeod. Ms. Elliot. Mrs. Elliot. Mr. Wilson. Mr. Wilson. Mr. Dunlop. Mr. Dunlop. Ms. Jones. Ms. Jones. Ms. Thompson. Ms. Thompson. Mr. Barrett. Mr. Barrett. Mrs. Monroe. Mrs. Monroe. Mr. Walker. Mr. Walker. Mr. Smith. Mr. Smith. Mr. Harris. Mr. Harris. Mr. Nichols. Mr. Nichols. Ms. Marteau. Ms. Marteau. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. Pettipiece. Mr. Pettipiece. Ms. Fife. Ms. Fife. Ms. Should be song. Should be song. Ms. Horvath. Ms. Horvath. Madame Jelena. Madame Jelena. Mr. Tabbins. Mr. Tabbins. Mr. Miller Hamilton East Stony Creek. Mr. Miller Hamilton East Stony Creek. Ms. Sattler. Ms. Sattler. Ms. Taylor. Ms. Taylor. Mr. Natasha. Mr. Natasha. Ms. Armstrong. Ms. Armstrong. Mr. Singh. Mr. Singh. Mr. Hatfield. Mr. Hatfield. Mr. Mantha. Mr. Mantha. Mr. Gates. Mr. Gates. Mrs. Gretzky. Mrs. Gretzky. Mr. Chimino. Mr. Chimino. Ms. French. Ms. French. Ted Ryan. The ayes are 57, the nays are 36. The ayes being 57 and the nays being 36, I declare the motion carried. There are no further votes. This House stands recessed until 3 p.m. this afternoon.